Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Homesteading series of the West Virginia Department of Agriculture. This evening, we are pleased to have Miss Annie Stroud and Dickinson Gold from Appalachian Abattoir. And with that, I will get through a couple of housekeeping items here, and then we will pass it off to Annie and Dickinson and, and let them do their thing here. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Cool. So, like I said, we'll go through a few of our business development housekeeping items here and then pass it off to Annie and Dickinson. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box throughout the program and we will get to those following the videos uh, for Annie and Dickinson. And with that, we'll go over planning coordinators, which is myself, Nathan, Nathan Bergdahl, excuse me. I'm the planning coordinator of the Eastern Panhandle for the WVDA. We also have Casey Ganser in the Northern Panhandle, Lacey Davidson in the Southwestern part of the state and Ashley Amos in the Southeastern part of the state. If you're in the middle central part of the state, don't fret, uh, please give us a call anyway and we'll certainly help you out. A little bit on our West Virginia Grown program, our premier branding program of state of West Virginia. Uh, also here on the right hand side, as you can see, new directory that we're coming out with that will soon be released. Actually, I believe it, it is out. Um, so if you haven't seen that, gives you a glimpse of uh, a few of our over 200 participants now, I believe it is. So it's growing every day. If you would like to join, please give us an email at the contact below. Uh, or give us a call in Charleston and we can certainly set you up with that. Our Veterans and Heroes to Agriculture program, many great trainings, uh, scholarships available, uh, nice little community of veterans and service providers, or excuse me, uh, service personnel that, uh, that we've created with Veterans and Heroes to Agriculture program and Dane Geyser has done a fabulous job with that. So with that, I will pass it over to Annie and Dickinson and they can get rolling. And please, again, if you leave your video and mics muted, drop any questions you may have for the two of them in the chat box. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Annie. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, it's, you know, on, on behalf of Annie and myself and our, our whole team at Buzz, we're really, uh, excited and grateful to be part of this uh, really helpful and successful series. So thank you for giving us the audience and for tuning in um, on this frigid uh, February night. Um, so I, I thought I would start just by just giving a little bit of background on our existing business, Buzz Food Service. If you're not familiar with Buzz, uh, the business started in Charleston in the late 1930s. It was originally called High Grade Sales. My family, my father, my grandfather, and two partners bought that existing business in 1968. And they bought that business primarily the value and the interest was in the, the retail product known as Buzz Buttered Steaks. Um, so if you're familiar with that product or if you've eaten a few in your lifetime, thank you very much for your business. Um, it, it continues to be a, a heavy nostalgia item for people in Southern West Virginia, and we're, we're very grateful for uh, the heartfelt stories that people tell us about where they ate and enjoyed buzz buttered steaks uh, long ago or even or even today. Uh, but over the last you know 50 plus years, the business has, has evolved several times over. Uh, you, when my father ran the business for uh, 35 years and uh, significantly expanded the operation, uh, adding full line distribution is how you would describe it. Things selling things like canned goods and frozen foods and paper supplies and everything from liquid dairy to fresh produce. And, uh, but all of that was, was, was here offered as a complement to what um, our origin story was, which was as a small specialty meat company. So um, our, our um, reputation has always been around a source of quality meats, and in recent years, we've spent a lot of time and effort to refocus on that core business and that um, center of the plate protein 
that we've always been known for. Um, so part of that refocusing has included adding fresh and frozen seafood to our offerings, which has been a, a perfect complement in our business and has led to a lot of growth. Um, and today, just as we have for the last 40 years, we, we serve a clientele of independent restaurants, hotels, country clubs, resort properties and the like. Um, we do this running a federally inspected meat processing facility here in Charleston. Um, but if you uh, if you understand the industry and our business, you realize that you know we're doing that with um, a significant volume of beef, pork, lamb, and veal that we buy from Midwestern packers. So our 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 role in the process is as the finished fabricator. We do the final work. We make that perfect eight ounce center cut fillet or that perfect ribeye roll steak that this that the chef. Um, has specked out for his menu uh, and his loyal customers. And, and that final quality assurance and quality control is uh, really our core business. Uh, but for the last decade or more, we've gotten a, cons a, a consistent drumbeat of interest from our customers. Of course, um, where does the beef come from? Where does the pork come from? And um, uh, we've gotten pretty good at explaining how the industry is built. And part of that explanation has been you know, that we lack certain pieces of critical agricultural infrastructure here in the state of West Virginia, in Southern West Virginia. We do have some local meat processing that can include live animal slaughter, uh, but there were a number of hurdles and, and challenges that, that prevented us from throwing ourselves fully into uh, a local meat movement. And so that's a little bit of the background of our business. I, I'm the third generation in my family to own and operate the business. I run it each day with my wife, Angela, and a and a and just an outstanding team of professionals, including Annie. Um, but this brings us to where we are today and, and uh, this exciting expansion of our business that I'll let Annie give you a little bit of background on. Great, thanks Dickinson. Um, so, as uh, Nathan said earlier, so I also work with Buzz Food Service and I'm the project manager specifically for the Appalachian Abattoir project um, at Buzz. And so a little bit about the project, if you aren't familiar with it, um, it's basically we're building a USDA inspected slaughter and processing facility um, co-located with our existing business in Rand. Um, and if you can see on the top left picture, We've got a small Buzz logo for the existing Buzz facility if you've ever um, had the opportunity to visit. Um, and then right next door, you'll see um, the Flash and Avatar logo. Um, there is a building in between, but we're right close by. Um, so we are going to be building about a 10,000 square foot facility uh, with a state-of-the-art kill floor, processing areas. We're very excited um, to have been able to work with Temple Grandin's Humane Livestock Handling Principles um, and got her to review our plans for the livestock pens and shoots leading into the kill floor. We will have a smokehouse, um, be able to do ready-to-eat products like bacons, hams, things like that. Uh, the facility is under construction and what we'll do next is I have a, a little um, tour of the current construction site. It's a little snowy right now, um, but the facility is set to be completed probably September of 2021. Um, when it is, well, in 2021, we're looking at adding probably eight to 12 new positions. Um, when the building's fully scaled up and we're operating at full capacity, we're probably looking closer at 25 to 30. Um, and two things related to that that I wanted to make sure to mention that aren't directly related to the services, but um, one thing that we're very excited about actually is that we have a registered meat cutting apprenticeship program um, that actually starts at Buzz Foods currently. Um, that application period will open March 1st, so if anyone's interested in more information, you can get in touch with us or check out the website. Um, and the other piece um, that's exciting and if you know anyone that would be a good fit, send them on our way. We're also currently hiring for the production manager who will um, manage all of the slaughter and production at the new facility. Um, do you have anything to add? No, that was great. All right, 
So I'm going to try and play this video. It worked a minute ago. <laughs> so <laughs> fingers crossed. All right, hi everybody. My name's Annie Stroud. I'm the project manager for Appalachian Abattoir at Buzz Food Service. Um, and we are standing on the construction site of the new facility. We're really excited to give you kind of a virtual tour of where we are in the building process and maybe help visualize what the facility is gonna look like when we are completed. So where I'm standing right now is actually part of the um, driveway area for the facility. We're gonna do a little tour, but kind of walk through it from the perspective of the the animal carcass as it moves through the facility. Right here, coming off of Frontage Road, trucks can come in and we're gonna have two loading docks. The livestock loading dock will be kind of near this first excavator here into the handling pen area. And then there'll be another loading dock that'll be where product can be offloaded when it's finished at the facility. So we can go ahead and walk this way. So this area is the livestock handling pens and our unloading area. So animals will get unloaded here this will be covered, so it'll be a covered area because it does get pretty warm here and obviously it gets pretty chilly in the winter. So one thing that's a little bit hard to see now, of course, because we don't have the pens up, we are going to have a row of pens here based on Temple Grandin's animal handling design principles. So the pens are going to be set up in such a way. And then up here at the other end where the chute is leading into the kill floor, we actually will have the full curved chute system. Um, as recommended by her design principles. And we were very excited to have her be able to provide us some feedback on the design. This is kind of a funny shape space to put animal handling pens in, but we got the A-OK -okay from Temple and we're very excited and proud to be working towards moving towards a humane handling facility. This is gonna be the entrance to the kill floor. Like I said before, we do have a chute system that'll bring animals around through separate ramps. Um, we have two kill boxes larger size one for cattle, smaller size ones for hogs and small ruminants here in this door. Um, we also have an entrance into the kill floor for employees and such things. So again, we're looking down into the kill floor. This is the beef box where it's gonna be, center doorway, squeeze box there. We will have a scalder for hogs. Uh, that will be right next door um, and then as the animal progresses down this room, it, the hide will be removed, the guts will be taken out. That, those doors you see down there are to the awful storage area, so that's where waste products will be stored. It's a refrigerated space, because as you can imagine, those products don't smell great. And there's a dock right at the other end there as well, to ensure that we can get rid of those products easily and away from the animals and our main uh, customer entrances and things like that. All right, so now we're looking at the kill floor again, but from the other side. Again, we've got the beef box on the right, other box on the left. This room is set up, we're missing a wall here right now, but this room is actually set up in a J shape. So again, animals are knocked, hides taken off, evisceration happens, guts get pulled out, go through that little window <laughs> into the uh, awful storage dock, and then get split in half. And at that point, for food safety reasons, those animals are gonna turn a corner, make a J shape, and come back up where they'll have the final trimming and wash, carcass wash process before they get put into the hot box, which is the initial room where the carcasses have to get brought down to temperature within 24 hours. So the hot box has super intense refrigeration to get the carcasses to the right temperature. Once they're at the right temperature, they'll then get moved into the holding cooler. So this side of this open space here um, will be our hot box and holding cooler. So the holding cooler will have a capacity to hold between, you know, 150, 200 carcasses at one time. Maybe more if it's a smaller animal, the spacing is closer. This is also where uh, animals that are going to be graded will hang out until the USDA grader can come cut the ribeye and actually inspect and grade the carcasses. So the next step in the process, uh, again, we don't have a wall, but you can kind of see these pipes, uh, will be the animals will come from the holding cooler into our processing area, which will be this blank space <laughs> here. And from the coolers, they'll start on this side and move that direction across the building, getting smaller as it goes. So on this side, 
is where they'll be taking the whole halves and quarters, boning them out, getting the big bones out that we don't save or use. And as the product gets further down the building, the pieces will get smaller. That's where the finished cuts will be turned into steaks and chip tops and roasts and the like with packaging on the far end. Um, we have the product freezer and cooler down there that'll be for the finished packaged product. So if you're a producer, that's where we'll store your product when you come to actually pick it up at the end. And we can actually walk down and give a little overview of the kind of office-y side of things. So right now we're standing in what will be our main hallway. So customers and farmers, anyone visiting the facility will enter in this way. We have offices here to my left. And as you go down, we have a couple more offices. We'll have our classroom space uh, right here. Where we'll be able to host any sort of groups that's interested in coming, whether that's chefs wanting to learn more, producer groups, students who want to learn more about carcass breakdown, anything like that. We have a kitchen break room. We do at some point hope to be able to host full, you know, workshops maybe where we do a carcass breakdown and then have an opportunity to taste some of what we break down. Um, another office and then that far door there is the exit into the storage dock so again if you show up to the facility to pick up your meat that you've got slaughtered here this is going to be where the front door is eventually um, and this area right next to us here is going to be our front office so this is hopefully where you'll have a smiling receptionist or you know our administrative manager to greet you and help you find your product this way we'll have a couple more offices again you see these second batch of double doors those are the doors into the classroom the next one down is into the kitchen and the furthest one down is the office for the usda inspectors so again this is the the back end or dirty end of the facility if you will this is the dock where the guts and hides and such things will be stored and set up for easy access to so the rendering company can come in and pick that stuff up keep it all refrigerated and out of the way and not smelling bad here in this building section here and as you can see we placed it this way too especially because it's important to keep that product away from where your animals are stored your live animals are hanging out um, so we have this down here so that it's not we're not getting cross traffic all customers will come and go via the larger parking lot on the other side of the building all right so this is a mock-up of what the outside of the building will look like easy to imagine that over there because it looks pretty similar but you know masonry siding obviously there's no roof on this but gives you a little bit of an idea for what the outside will look like when it's completed all right so um that was just kind of a little tour of the building as always if you have questions about uh, where we are in construction. We do have an email newsletter um, that we send periodic updates out on. We have a Facebook page and a website. Um, so there's a number of different ways you can kind of keep track of our progress and updates and see where we're going as far as the, the physical construction of the facility. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dickinson and we've got another video to show about um, the the facility and some of the services that we'll be offering, but I don't know if you wanted to go over some things first. Uh, I think you're still muted, Dickinson. Sorry. Uh, rather than repeat anything that'll that'll play in the small segment, go go ahead and roll it, Annie, and then and then we can review. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. The plan that we put together and that is now you know finally coming together this year is to add local processing facility where we can perform live animal slaughter of beef, pork, and lamb, interact directly with local producers to both improve on the quality of their product that they're already selling uh, to friends, neighbors, coworkers, and to the public, but also create an opportunity for those producers to sell into our existing wholesale supply chain. So the ultimate goal is for us to contract with local producers and put red meat on the menus of local restaurants. We think that becomes a, a, a critical part of the hospitality and tourism industry. It becomes a, a story of any restaurant that takes advantage of that and it becomes a new selling opportunity for producers. Last 
75 years or more, we've really evolved multiple times. We've gone into uh, full line distribution of things like canned goods and disposables and paper supplies. And we've ventured into fresh produce and liquid dairy, but the constant and the, the mainstay in our business profile and our competitive advantages is a specialty meat company. The steady drumbeat that we've heard from our customers is you know, where does the beef come from? Where does the pork come from? Who raised this lamb? We started this expansion project intent on changing that. We knew that major change couldn't come to the local meat industry without construction of a significant facility. I'm really optimistic that having access to local processing who you know and trust will eventually bring more people into livestock production. I, I think the change could be significant in that way. We're creating a model where we can help more local producers sell their product directly to the public. And we're also creating a scenario where we would be the buyers. Someone who can tell the story of locally raised beef, pork, and lamb, connect with the consumer and be the connecting force between farmer and consumer. That's what this area has lacked for a long time. So when you talk about local and what uh, Dickinson was alluding to about you know local products, uh, if you go into a restaurant now or a grocery store, I mean, what is really local? Maybe some local produce, uh, maybe some local meat companies, bacon or, or, or hot dogs and things like that, but that product isn't raised here. What we're looking to do here is even beyond selling steaks and cuts to the local chefs and restaurants in the area, there are so many more opportunities for us and the producers in the area to move product to the consumers of West Virginia and keep that product here. Whether it be chorizo, sausages, and different worsts, we're gonna have a state-of-the-art smokehouse, so we'll have locally made bacon, deli meats, you know, roast beef, corned beef, pastrami, maybe hams, uh, some high-end charcuterie possibly, uh, ready-to-eat products, uh, be it pulled, locally produced pulled pork uh, already made in barbecue sauce or back ribs and things like that. So for us, it goes beyond just the custom beef, which we will be doing for the producers and selling it to the local chefs and restaurants. It gets it out to all the consumers in West Virginia, keeping more of that product here and uh, with the, the consumers of West Virginia, giving them an opportunity to buy locally produced and raised and processed further uh, value added meats, so to speak. This filet mignon was packaged on a continuous feed roll stock machine. So what you see here is one hard side of plastic and then a soft side that forms around the shape of the steak. And what that does, you can see, it just shows uh, so clearly the shape of the steak and even, even displays this, what we call marbling, this intramuscular fat. The steak faced so clearly on both sides. I can promise you this is exactly eight ounces. This is the type of work that we do for our restaurant customers now. I think when we bring this degree, this type of packaging and this degree of care and craftsmanship to the local livestock community, people selling freezer beef, every customer right down to the end user are gonna be really happy. We're excited about the change that this can bring, but it's an entirely new business for us and we're gonna be adding services and tasks and uh, opportunities as quickly as we can. We're doing this to help the local farming community and I think it can be a real leg up and a new opportunity for livestock producers. And so if, if you're patient with us and we can problem solve together, then I think in the end, we'll all be happy for the effort and, and uh, I think great things can come. Dickinson? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, um, I'm going to mute myself here. So let me know if you need anything. I will. Um, so hopefully those two videos were um, useful background. And a big thank you to Mick from the Department of Ag, who did a great job. He spent a half a day here with us and really um, made us look good. So I hope that was helpful. For me, it was a not very helpful reminder of how badly I need a haircut, but these are COVID times. So uh, thank you for humoring me. This new facility, as we've alluded to, presents two different business models that, that come into play simultaneously. Let's talk first and foremost of what we're calling the service model. So local producers 
are in the tradition and the habit of uh, of of paying for what's called or described as custom processing or, and sometimes referred to as custom exempt. This is where you you as the producer bring livestock to a local processing facility and and you fill out a cut sheet and you come back three weeks later and you pick up the product that you dropped off, you pay a service bill and you leave with product that you have likely pre-sold in the form of a, a, a whole beef, a quarter or half uh, beef, pork or lamb. Um, and you're selling that to a, a friend, a, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, or, or maybe someone that you connected with on social media. Um, so our, what we call a service model is, is most similar to that. Um, the reason we don't refer to it as custom or custom exempt is because again, we will have the benefit of federal inspection in the facility. So every animal that comes through our facility will bear, uh, the, the packaged meats will bear our mark of inspection, which creates two unique opportunities. It gives the, the owner the ability to sell it across state lines, which custom exempt or even state inspected product uh, does not offer. Um, and it will also give you the ability to sell individual cuts if you chose to do that um, at a farmer's market or, or even directly to a restaurant. Um, so the USDA inspection is really a unique new offering in that way. Um, and we, we'll touch on that again. Uh, of course, you know, we have an established business. We're not, we're not starting um, the idea of a service model from scratch. We think that having full-time staff dedicated to scheduling, um, pricing, pickup, communication with customers uh, will be a great relief um, in, this, in this space. I mean, I think all too often the person who's scheduling um, appointments and drop-offs is the same person who's attempting to manage the kill floor or run a smoker and make bacon. And, and it's, it, I think it's, we know that the scale of the operation we're trying to create will require full-time customer service that's available for producers to work with. We think that'll be to everyone's benefit. Um, furthermore, you know, the video showed you a few examples of, of what we would call quality craftsmanship. I mean, we're creating portion control meats in the form of steaks, chops, roasts, and, and grinds, sausages, and other value-added products already every day in our business for what I would describe as the most discerning and demanding customer base you can imagine, uh, the, the most successful um, and well-established chefs in all the markets that we serve work with Buzz and we're in the business of understanding their expectations. If we can meet their high demands, we think we can meet the demands of uh, the, the processed meat audience, uh, or, or we hope so. Um, of course, we bring to the, to the table uh, quality packaging solutions. So not just the, the roll stock package that we saw in the video and that you see in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, but you know, we're in the business of, of packaging and labeling meat, um, again, to a very high standard. And we just think that that is going to show through to anyone who is, you know, marketing their own brand of beef, their own livestock uh, to an audience of any type is going to appreciate the quality of the labeling, packaging, and the craftsmanship that we uh, exhibit in the product. Perhaps most exciting of this entire project is the fact that we won't only be USDA inspected, we will have USDA grading services in this facility. So this will be a first of its kind service offered anywhere in any small plant in the state of West Virginia. Uh, we will have USDA staff on hand. Actually, it'll be, I'm sorry, State Department of Ag staff trained to perform uh, grading services that will objectively uh, measure the quality of beef, pork, and lamb. And that's not something that can or should be done um, by the person who runs a small plant or by the customer. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a science and evidence-based process that determines whether a carcass of beef grades as select, choice, prime, uh, or into a branded program with other specifications. And, and so it's, 
it's going to be not only a great selling opportunity for producers to upcharge something that grades as USDA prime, but all customers that we serve will receive a grading report. They will receive data back about the livestock that they brought to our facility. And we will learn individually and we will learn collectively about what's working well and what's not. Um, our intention is to work with producers in a way that highlights and tells the story of the people that are getting the best results. Let's learn from each other and let's improve together. And so whether that's you know, basic herd management processes or investments in genetics or uh, smart decisions about feed um, and, and grass management, uh, there's, there's always more ways to share information um, to the benefit of, of the entire ag community. And we wanna be part of that. We wanna help that along. Um, we will have a very similar tiered pricing structure for service work. Um, certain you know, cost per pound billed by the hanging weight, uh, certainly a, some sort of a fixed uh, kill fee by speed that varies by species. Um, and then, you know, small add-ons for other value added services, like maybe we make patties for you instead of ground beef, or we make sausage instead of turning over ground pork. Uh, we might um, smoke, your smoke your bellies and make bacon for you. Um, there might be packaging premiums that you wanna consider. Um, all of that is uh, pretty standard for this part of the industry. Yeah, producers will fill out cut sheets, uh, probably very similar to what you've seen in other small facilities. I do wanna use as an example, this potential label on the right. And this, this is not a finished label. This is just sort of a placeholder or a concept, but you can see a, a full color label that in this case, the primary logo used is that of the facility. The second line identifies the source of livestock. The third line identifies the individual cut. And then the bottom of the tag identifies the graded um, the grade assigned to the to that beef product. So um, we are putting ourselves in a position to offer highly customized full color labeling to even our smallest producers. If you have a logo that you use in your operation uh, or that you use to brand your uh, beef, pork or lamb program, we expect to be in a position to produce la small labels of this variety uh, that really celebrate the brand you're already building or the brand that you've always wanted to build. And I think uh, this you know, top-notch, highest quality labeling can really be of value in a farmer's market setting or even on the end of, of five boxes that are delivered as a freezer beef order. Um, we look forward to exploring all of those opportunities, but I think you're gonna be excited about what you see. Um, so that's that's a little bit, uh, uh, probably a lot about the service model. Um, key questions. We have not yet opened the book for service appointments. Um, and that's because as you've seen already, we're, we're still under construction and, and we were really making steady gains during the winter, but now it's mid-February and it's it's been a big sloppy mess. So we just wanna make sure that everything is going to be finished and ready on schedule before we, um, like I said, open the book and start taking appointments. But we still expect that to happen sometime in April or May of this year. And and the people on this on this um, uh, webcast tonight will 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 have all the communication around when that happens. Um, of course, we will be processing beef, pork, lamb, and goat, uh, placing limits on what you know. We just don't feel prepared to handle. Um, bison, we won't be doing any poultry, seafood, or cattle with horns over 24 inches. That's just for the safety of our staff and, and, and that of the animals. Um, the best way to stay in touch and informed is to make sure that you're on our email newsletter. There's a few ways listed there um, to gain access. And um, I suspect there will be questions about the service model when we get to the Q&A section of this call. Uh, so I look forward to those. But we know that there's a significant backlog of local processing. Um, we have heard first and secondhand repeatedly 
people waiting a year for a processing appointment. Um, we know that some of the smaller processors in and around the state that are used to maybe doing 300 head in a year have scaled up to do 600, uh, but it's too much and it's not um, a scalable activity uh, so easily. So this plant aims to relieve a lot of that pressure while also bringing new service offerings and, and amenities uh, is how we feel about it. Let's keep going, Annie. All right, so moving along to another really exciting component of this project is as we've already established that Buzz is um, a well-known distributor of Midwestern box beef, pork, and lamb. We buy more than a million pounds a year currently from Midwestern packers, and that's product that we would love to convert a large portion of to locally raise livestock. And so um, as we get comfortable in the facility, as we meet and work with more producers on the service model side of this business, our full intention is to be able to buy graded carcasses from local producers um, at fair market wages, pay them on what's called a grid. So the fact that we're going to be able to grade the product and identify what's prime, what's high choice, what's select, what's a yield grade one versus a yield grade four. All of those things are true um, value to the end user, to us as the, produce, as the processor, and should be paid in premiums to the local producer. And that's our intention. That's very different than selling livestock at uh, the local stockyard or in lots to uh, Midwestern packers that may or may not share any quality data once the animal is harvested and graded. So um, our intention is to develop this new source of wholesale product with traceability and source verification as, as a key component of it, right? We wanna work with local producers that are getting great results and raising the best quality product because that's what our base of restaurant, hotel and resort property customers, that's the story that they wanna tell. They wanna. They want to operate as the proverbial chalkboard restaurant where on a Friday night, they say tonight's special uh, is ribeye steaks from Kanawha land and cattle processed locally. Um, we want to help local chefs and retailers celebrate the work of the local ag community. And uh, that's what has not been able to happen as much as it should without a, a facility like what we're building and talking about tonight. Um, so of course, grade and yield reports will be shared in this scenario as well, helping producers understand the investments that they've made in genetics, the choices that they've made around herd management and um, uh, feed models, uh, the target weights that are working best and bringing the best results. We expect to get better together as this product goes along, and we often talk about this this expansion as as a big data project. I think in our first year of operation, we will likely gather more hard data and information about local beef, pork, and lamb than any source uh, in in the state of West Virginia has to date. Um, and we and we intend to share it. We want to we want to use that data to help out all producers uh, raise their game. As we all know, a rising tide lift all, lifts all boats. So, um, you know, we what what I hope is not disappointing to the folks tuning in tonight is that we are not ready to share or introduce a pricing model yet, but we can promise you that it's going to be um, competitive, if and likely favorable to selling opportunities that producers have in this market today. Uh, we are uh, we will be a new buyer on the playground and that is that can a new buyer of any scale can only be good uh, for the sellers and so we look forward to working with um, many producers of all shapes and sizes you don't have to have a minimum head count you don't have to have um, a devotion to the angus breed uh, these are the things that we've heard from producers we we really look forward to working with experienced producers, but also folks that are new to the game, but serious about producing quality beef, pork, and lamb. That's 
that's how we're approaching this. And, and uh, we look forward to all of those conversations. Let's keep going, Annie. So key questions about the, this wholesale model. Um, we fully intend to be buying carcasses and, and, and selling them in our wholesale supply chain in this calendar year, in 2021. We have many chefs and customers that uh, can't wait to participate and want to support, want to get their hands on beef, pork, and lamb that was raised locally, and and it's and it's our desire uh, to have it for them. So um, we're not pumping the brakes on that in any way. Uh, we have to build a staff, we have to get experience, we have to make sure um, that we can produce the quality of product that our customers are already used to uh, with our established business, and, and we're confident that we can and that we will. Um, again, the best way to stay in touch is to um, email, as you see below, you can request a copy of current guideline specifications around weight and, um, you know, standards, of course, it, it, it's really pretty simple and familiar to most of you. Uh, you know, we have an expectation that um, producers that we buy from will have uh, gone through beef quality assurance training. That's not asking a lot. These are steps that you take for your herd and your investment already. In most cases, it's BQA certification and training is something that many of our customers will want and expect to see, especially if and when we begin to approach um, national retailers, national chains, uh, national ho hotel chains, for instance, uh, have minimum expectations around that. B BQA would be uh, just one of, of a few. So you can learn more about those um, specifications and the, as they're still being developed by staying in touch with Annie and, um, and subscribing to our newsletter. And um, I, I look forward to some great questions from the group on this front. Let's keep going, Annie. All right. I think um, we're all set for questions. Nathan, I'm not sure if you guys had a slide you wanted to put up or you wanna leave this one. Either, either way is fine, just let us know. No, I think we can leave that up. Um, <laughs> And thank you so much. That was extremely in depth and and very uh, enlightening. So, please, audience, if you have questions for Dickinson or Annie, you can feel free to take your mic off mute and ask those. Um, not seeing any in the chat box yet, but uh, please, if you have questions for either of the two of them, please unmute your mics and question away, uh, buddy. Go ahead, yes, I saw I saw a story the other day about um, you all starting an apprenticeship program for meat cutters. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, what we have is a it's a two year, well, about two and a half year um, meat cutting apprenticeship made up of on the job learning where you can work in the meat shop at Buzz. So that is a program that can start um, the application period will open on March 1st um, and it will be open on a rolling basis so folks can apply and get started with that program kind of throughout um, and it will include you know basically how a, a learning course that teaches you how to cut all of the major species that we'll be working with um, the first apprenticeship that we're doing the meat cutting apprenticeship that um, you heard about is focused on retail um, presentation so looking at those really nicely done finished products um, and what it takes to both skill wise um, and merchandising wise to produce that kind of a, a product specifically. We are planning once we have the facility up and running to actually add a second track, which would be more focused on um, slaughter specifically and include some more time spent on kill floors, animal handling, those types of items that we don't do currently at Buzz. Yeah, well said, Annie. Uh, what we know is that there are uh, career opportunities in the meat industry up and down the supply chain. Um, like we alluded to, there's there's not a, a, a retail grocery store in this state that wouldn't say the same story. They have trouble um, finding people that are experienced meat cutters, people who understand cost and yield and presentation and want to stick with that um as a as a job or a career and we feel like we have 
the skills and, and the and the training in the workplace to learn the industry from top to bottom. And we might just train a whole army, a whole next generation of um, really knowledgeable meat people um, that can go, that can stay and work for us for a long time or, or um, might find other opportunities with their own retail butcher shop or their own um, small facility or, or, or running a retail meat counter. There's, there is no shortage of opportunities and, we're excited to be part of the overdue education. Thanks, and great if, question. Yeah, and if anyone's interested, if you go to the um, Buzz website, um, there's a section there where you can actually download the outline and standards for the apprenticeship program if you're curious about what kind of topics we'll be covering and those kinds of things. Have you all, um, you know, there's a few FFA meat cutting programs out there or some secondary school ones out there. Don't forget about those let us know at the department if we can help you reach out to any of them oh I, I i i completely agree i have toured some of the state's um secondary school meat labs and processing rooms and and i've seen 16 year olds that i would hire in a heartbeat so um if i think young people in ffa sometimes think gosh i'm passionate about meat i would love to have a career in meat but the only way they can think to do it is maybe by raising a few head of cattle and we we aim to 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 change their opinion of that thanks more questions for annie and dickinson can't tell me no one else has questions for you. <laughs> Quiet punch tonight. Wow. OK, well, I'll start firing away if that's all right then. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, Johnny and Michelle, please go ahead. I think you're muted there if you're trying to ask. I'm trying. There you go. Can you hear me, Nathan? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Johnny. <clears throat> well, we noticed on there that there was 11 and 1300 pounds. That's the weight spread in your finished animals. In our world, finished animals are weighing 15, 1600 pounds. If you're going to deal with 11 or 1300 pound finished animal, you're going to primarily deal with heifers. You're going to deal with female animals. We get discounted for animals on the live market if these cattle aren't weighing 1300 plus. So what is your objective of harvesting animals that weigh at between 11 and 1300 pounds? What is what's the objective? Well, I, what I can say is that, you know, the the we for perspective, we have long been uh, uh, fortunate to be a, a licensed processor and distributor of certified Angus beef. And CAB has sort of set the standard around um, carcass sizing, right? That if you get dinged for an animal that's too large, uh, it's because the hot carcass weight exceeds 1,050 pounds. And the reason that that's important to certified Angus beef is the reason that it's important to us, which is the reason that it's important to our our chefs is that middle meats there is such a thing as middle meats that get too big right the the when the when the eye of a ribeye exceeds 16 square inches making a 12 ounce portion on a plate gets thinner and thinner and thinner right so i think um you know having a having a ceiling on that i'm, I'm not suggesting that a 1500 pound animal is is too big um, but we think that um, there is a sweet spot to be found with a smaller animal um, that can still produce a well-marbled, very high-quality product without any of the negative effects of being too large, I guess. And I, I will also share for perspective, your your question, John and Michelle, is, is not what we hear most frequently, right? You're you may be in the minority of folks that are in a position to finish your cattle locally 
And I think what we have in the state uh, is a lot of cow calf operators that sell feeders at the stockyard and, and, and they're going to be new to the, to the idea of finishing their cattle and adding that last couple hundred pounds. So, um, you know, we're not kicking out or denying a 1500 pound animal, nor do we look down on a, an a maturity heifer, uh, as a source of great quality beef. Um, you know, we're, we're anxious to see as much product as we can and determine who's getting the best quality results and what's working best. And in the end, you may convince us that the animals need to be 1400 pounds, but uh, you know, we'll, we're going to, we're going to wait and gather as much evidence as we can. Does, does that answer your question to any satisfaction? Well, <clears throat> economically, you know, a 1,300-pound animal at a 60% carcass yield is going to yield you a 780-pound carcass. Mm -hmm. Economically, you got to swing a big carcass. And a big carcass, I mean, is a 900-plus-pound carcass. When you're feeding cattle, it's advantageous to you to swing a big carcass. That's where your money is. It all comes down to the bottom dollar of feeding that animal. Now, you can go beyond the point where it is not an advantage to feed that animal any longer because your, you know, your conversion rate as that animal gets larger, uh, you know, kind of shrinks. But, you know, when we sell fat cattle on the live market here in Moorfield, you know, these guys want these cattle to swing a big carcass. Sure. They want a 900 pound plus carcass to swing. So that's what I, that's, you know, when you start talking about a 1300 pound finished animal, that is going to primarily be an S grade steer or a female. That's what that animal is going to be. And we get discounted uh, when we go into the live cattle market and these peppers are weighing over 1,300 pounds. The buyers discount us. You said when they aren't over 1,300 pounds. Right. A heifer for us needs to be 1,300 pound plus, or she's going to get discounted in the sale ring. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, John, and I'm not discounting the buyer or what their motivation is. Uh, I, I don't want to reference certified Angus beef more than I should, because we're not, we're not looking for CAB cattle in this case. Um, but the average hot carcass in the certified Angus beef program over the last 12 months is less than 840 pounds. Mm. And, and that's a consistently upper two thirds choice product. Um, that's all a maturity steers and heifers. And so, I mean, we, in a, uh, we hope that there is a solution that can work for us and for the producer. Um, and maybe the incentives are going to align differently. And, and, and um, I, I would, I would love and welcome the chance to continue this conversation with you offline, John, and learn more about, you know, where the animals are going and what kind of a program they might grade into and what kind of data you get back about your cattle. I, I, you're, you're, you're clearly somebody who's, who's uh, thoughtful about what they're doing now. And I don't want, I don't want you to change your goals. We don't, we're not trying to change any producers process or habits unless it's to their benefit. So that that's where the conversations will hopefully bring us all to the same place. Well, I would, I would much enjoy speaking with you in a private setting as well. Great. And and uh, we do appreciate uh, the effort that you're all putting into this to supply uh, your processing facilities with West Virginia grown beef cattle. Thank we you. appreciate it very much. It gives us another market outlet. Those of us who are in the cattle feeding business, we appreciate it very much. That's the goal. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words and, and for the great question. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. If you'll share your uh, contact information in, in any of the forms that we've talked about, we'll, we'll be in touch ASAP. Okay. Same Thank as, you. Thank you, sir. Great question.
Yeah, I can uh, I can take it to connect the two of you and and Annie if need be and and get a conversation going. So uh, beautifully put question, Johnny. Thank you for that and the comment. Obviously, um, very valid point. Anyone else questions for Annie and Dickinson? Okay, uh, I've got one for you. I don't believe you've covered uh, capacity this evening and love um, the business model and in the wholesale and processing side of things and, and vice versa. Could you talk a little bit about one capacity and how much of the log jam it might be able to free up in the state uh, and also potentially the percentage of purchasing compared to processing? Sure, I'll, I'll start and then Annie, you're, you're free to add to or, or correct me um, in any way that's necessary. You know, we have often, when we asked about, when we're asked about scale, we have often used as, an, as a proxy, as an estimate, um, you know, that, that this facility was designed to process, imagine 20 head of beef cattle a day which would be 100 head a week or 5,000 head plus, give or take, over the course of a year. Um, my, maybe someone will fact check me on this, but my guess is that 5,000 head of beef cattle processed in this facility would match or exceed the collective total of all the existing small plants in the state over the course of a year. Um, so we think in terms of capacity, it's a big leap forward. Of course, it is a mixed species facility, so you know smaller animals, the work is faster. Um, there's, as we've studied other small plants of this model in other markets, it's it's of course very common to have a day where you do 12 head of beef, 20 lamb, and 10 hogs, right? Um, so what the product mix will end up being. It will be determined, we think, by the market and by the opportunity. Um, but there's a lot of demand, and um, frankly, the the more we, the more conversations we have with small producers. And lately, we've had a couple of conversations with people that that have built from scratch small, modern food safe plants, very similar to what we're we're building. Um, who look at the facility and say, you could do way more than 20 head a day. You could, don't feel limited by 20 head a day or a hundred head a week or, or whatever that number is. But, you know, let's, um, it's it, baby steps, right? Um, we're, we'll open the plant with an idea of what it takes to break even. And then we'll be in a collective uh, mindset of, you know, we have got to get production to the point where it covers all of our variable and fixed costs. And we think we can do that pretty fast. And then uh, we feel like we'll have a strong incentive to process as much livestock as we can and employ as many people as we can and really find out what we can do in the facility. But as a conservative estimate, over the course of a year at full capacity, we could do at least 5,000 head of beef cattle. That's what we think. Sorry, that was probably way too many words, but I hope that answered your no, question. That, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. And the second part of that, maybe Annie, could you speak a little bit about, I know this is obviously way too early in the ball game, um, but just possible projections on your percentage of, of wholesale compared to uh, the processing side of things. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think what we've talked about throughout is when we get started, we'll probably be doing a higher percentage of the service work um, as we build up a network of producers that we want to work for and simultaneously, because this is the the balancing act that Buzz is going to have to do, right, of course, is working with producers to build up supply at the same time that we're developing the market for that local product locally. So there's going to be a little bit of a ramping up period, I think. Um, and that's where Dan, who you saw in the video, comes in. He's he's our kind of business development um, person who's been working with us at Buzz and the Appalachian Avatar. Um, you know, but what we've kind of talked about is we'll probably start looking at something that's more like 70, 30 processing to buying. And then as the facility gets up and running, 
potentially seeing that even out, um, you know, as much as as much as the market um, needs it to. I mean, I think one thing, you know, Dickinson mentioned that we're looking at 5,000 head, and that's a big group of animals for West Virginia, but that's a drop in the bucket when it comes to meat processing generally, right? So I think, you know, the other piece too is that if we get to the point where we are completely full up and busy and, you know, we need more um, processing to fill our wholesale orders and those kinds of things, best case scenario, you know, we're able to help another plant someplace else get ramped up, um, you know, we want more people to be processing as the end goal. You know, at, at this point, I don't think we know exactly what that final percentage would look like, but we've thought throughout that we'll probably start with a higher percentage of processing service work um, and having that potentially switch as we get closer to the having the wholesale markets fully developed. Yeah, it's all that's a great answer, Annie. I, if I can just add a couple of things, data points that are potentially of interest. There are plants in the Midwest that do 5,000 head of beef in a day. A, a day. So in the grand scheme of things, this is still a micro facility in compared to large scale beef processing in the Midwest. And, and that's that's very intentional. That's by design. Um, but let me also say that, you know, when we're buying beef, pork and lamb from a Midwestern packer now, we have the luxury of buying exactly what our needs are or exactly what the needs of our customers are. So we could buy a hundred cases of beef tenderloin and take nothing else. The packer would be happy to sell it to us. Um, in this scenario, we're doing whole animal butchery. We accept the burden of carcass balancing. We have to sell all the parts and pieces in unison. For every two pieces of tenderloin, we're gonna have hundreds of pounds of other cuts and grinds. And you know, we sell every muscle on the animal now, beef, pork, and lamb, uh, but we don't necessarily sell it in that type of balance. And so um, we've we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about how those markets develop. And we have, I feel like for, if there are trouble spots around carcass balancing, we don't just have plan A, we have plan A, B, C, and hopefully D. And, and we think it can all come together and it can come together quickly. If it comes together as quickly as we like, then we'll put to the we'll put the pedal to the metal and we'll we'll do as much wholesale purchasing as we can. Um, but in but it's probably pretty likely that in the earliest days we'll do as much service work as as people need and as we can. Um, and that'll also give us a chance to see the quality of of what local producers bring in. And we'll undoubtedly meet producers that way and we'll see what they've brought us and we'll say, hey, if, you know, next time would you consider, you know, selling us a couple of these carcasses? And and that's sort of a organic development of the business model that offers both service and wholesale. And we're excited about all those conversations. We hope producers see that as a good thing. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Questions? Hey, let me let me ask a question from a little different perspective as a non-producer, but a big fan of the finished product. Could you tell us a little bit more about your vision for the retail operations of the new facility? Yeah, uh, so I hope I I hope I answer this um, correctly. We we don't intend to have an on-site retail storefront here. Initially, we thought that we would, and then because many small plants do and do it very successfully, but ultimately we decided space was limited. And if we were gonna if we were gonna sell this product to local consumers in the Charleston market, we wanted it to be supremely convenient. So uh, we actually have separately but simultaneously. Um, opened a retail butcher shop in downtown Charleston that will be, a, a, we hope, a critical selling point for local product and a place where people could go and pick out steaks and chops and grinds and and um, and see the product on display and ask great questions. Um, so that'll absolutely be, you know, that'll be sort of like the retail storefront um, that we'll start to you know, talk more about as, as we actually have product in the marketplace. Um, 
And then your question was, you also mentioned, you know, the, the, I think you mentioned the marbled grain finished. I, I do want to say we, we get a lot of questions about whether or not grass fed will be part of our wholesale offering. And my response to that is, you know, absolutely. Anything that's in demand um, from the marketplace should be part of the product mix. I, I, I think we've established through discussion tonight that our business is sort of built on that, you know, that Midwestern grain finished, uh, well marbled, high, you know, uh, high choice and prime product and that traditionally comes from grain feeding. But uh, there is absolutely a market for and a growing interest in and demand for grass finished product. And ultimately, we fully expect that to be an extension of what we do. We expect to do processing work for a lot of grass-fed producers, and um, and we hope to have some of that product in our wholesale supply chain as well. And um, I hope that some part of that answered your question, Ted. Thank you. Yeah, it, it absolutely did. And this is really an exciting project, and I think it'll mean a lot for the uh, local economy. So kudos. Great presentation. Thanks a lot. Any further questions for Annie and Dickinson, folks? No? Did I hear somebody hop off mute? That was just me. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, last chance. What we got here in the chat box. Got um, how, how far from Lisa Jones? How far will your will your distribution go for buyers? Uh, great question. So currently, we have buzz trucks in six states. We have product cut in our shop in Charleston that goes to restaurants as far north as Erie, Pennsylvania, as far east as State College, PA. We have product going to restaurants in Cleveland, in border other border towns in Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, and we have limited distribution in in North Carolina. So um, it touches on something that we we think of as the real gold ring, the real trophy of all of these efforts is the idea that there could be product raised in West Virginia processed in West Virginia by West Virginia workers, packaged and sold to people out of state where all of that revenue and profit comes back into West Virginia. And man, we just don't have enough examples of that anymore. I don't think there's there's no such thing as too much of that when you talk about local agriculture. So um, you may have a specific market in mind when you ask that question. And um, we, you know, we could answer that now or, or offline about about where we go. But we also see the product that will come out of this facility, probably taking us into entirely new markets as well. And uh, we'll go where the demand is. Thank you for that. Great question too, Lisa. Um, Great question. From from Blair, where is the facility exactly? So, so Buzz is just east of Charleston, outside of the city limits. Um, we have a Charleston address, but you would it's probably best described as Rand. Um, and if you drive on Route 60, going east from Charleston, you pass the mouth of Campbell's Creek Drive. We're less than a mile down the road on the left. So we're on the hill side of Route 60 rather than the river side of Route 60 if that helps you orient yourself. And so again, you know, Buzz, that's where Buzz is and has been since the mid eighties. And this facility luckily is co-located. We'll have about 50 yards of space in between the two facilities, which we hope allows us to share a lot of resources, including staff on some days. And a clarification too. So the retail shop that Dickinson mentioned is um, called General Steak and Seafood and is located um, downtown off of Courier. Street Dickinson? It's at the corner of Brooks and Quarrier Streets in downtown Charleston. Yeah. Yeah.
Anyone else questions? We have covered a tremendous amount of information <laughs> in uh, an hour and 12 minutes. OK, well, I think with that we can get out of here. Please sign up for their newsletter if you want to stay in touch. Email addresses um, or you can reach out to us at the department and we can certainly get you in touch. But Dixon, Annie, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us this evening. Uh, appreciate you tremendously. And with that, um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us as well. Um, but our next episode will be composting in the homesteading series, and we will have that out to you in our newsletter. So Appalachian Abattoir, thank you so much for taking your time, and, and thank you all for joining us. Have a nice My day. pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, everybody.